Mr. Attorney General, the special counsel's report describes how the president directed White House counsel Don McGahn to fire special counsel Mueller and later told McGahn to write a letter, quote, for our records, end quote, stating that the president had not ordered him to fire Mueller. The report also recounts how the president made repeated efforts to get McGahn to change his story. Knowing that McGahn believed the president's version of events was false, the special counsel found, and I quote, substantial evidence, end quote, that the president tried to change McGahn's account in order to prevent further scrutiny of the president towards the investigation. Special counsel also found that McGahn is a credible witness with no motive to lie or exaggerate given the position he held in the White House. Here's the question. Does existing law prohibit efforts to get a witness to lie to say something the witness believes is false? Uh, yes. And lie, what, lie to the government, yes. And, and what law is that? Obstruction statutes. The obstruction st statute. And you, you don't have it, I guess, before you. Well, I'm not sure which, which one they were referring to here. It was, it, it, it was probably 1512C2. So these things, in effect, constitute obstruction. Well, you're talking in general terms. You're not talking... Uh, what I'm talking about specifically, yes, you're, you're, you're correct in a sense that the, substantial, the, the special counsel in his report found substantial evidence that the president tried to change McGahn's account in order to prevent, and this is a quote, further scrutiny of the president toward the investigation, and quote. The special counsel also found McGahn is a credible witness with no motive to lie or exaggerate. So what I'm asking you then, is that a credible charge under the obstruction statute? We, we, felt that, we felt that that episode, the government would not be able to establish obstruction. The, if you go back and you, if, if you look at the, um, the episode where uh, McGahn, uh, the president gave McGahn an obstruction, uh, an, an instruction. McGahn's version of that is quite clear in, in each time he gave it, which is that the uh, instruction said, go to Rosenstein, raise the issue of conflict of interest, and Mueller has to go because of this conflict of interest. So there's no question that 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 the whatever instruction was given McGahn had to do with conflict of Mueller's conflict of interest. Now, the president later said that what he meant was that the conflict of interest should be raised with Rosenstein, but the decision should be left with Rosenstein. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, it appears that McGahn felt it was more directive and that the president was essentially saying, push Rosenstein to invoke uh, uh, a conflict of interest to push Mueller out. Wherever it fell on that spectrum of interest, the New York Times story was very different. The New York Times story said flat out that the president directed the firing of Mueller. He told McGahn, fire Mueller. Now, that, there's something very different between firing a special counsel outright, which suggests ending the investigation, and having a special counsel removed for conflict, which suggests that you're going to have another special counsel. So the fact is that even under McGahn's, uh, and, and, and then, as the report says and, and recognizes, there is evidence the president truly felt that the Times article was inaccurate, and he wanted McGahn to correct it. So we believe that it would be impossible uh, for the government to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the president understood that he, that he was instructing McGahn to say something false because it wasn't necessarily false. Moreover, McGahn had weeks before already given testimony to the, uh, to the special counsel, and the president was aware of that. And 
as, as the report indicates, it could also have been the case that, what he, that he was primarily concerned about press reports and making it clear that he never outright directed the firing of Mueller. So in, ter so in terms of the request to ask McGahn to memorialize that fact, we do not think in this case that the government could show corrupt intent beyond a reasonable doubt. Just to finish this, but you still have a situation where a president essentially tries to change the lawyer's account in order to prevent further criticism of himself. Well, that's not a crime. So you can, in this situation, instruct someone to lie? No, it has to be, well, to be obstruction of justice, the lie has to be uh, tied to uh, impairing the evidence in a particular proceeding. McGahn had already given his evidence, and I think, uh, I think it would be plausible that the purpose of McGahn memorializing what the president was asking was to make the record that the president never directed him to fire. And there is a distinction between saying to someone, go fire him, go fire Mueller, and saying, have him removed based on conflict. And what would they have different results. What would that conflict be? Well, the, the difference between them is if you remove someone for a conflict of interest, then there would be a, another, presumably another person appointed. Yeah, but wouldn't you have to have it in this kind of situation, an identifiable conflict that made sense, or else doesn't it just become a fabrication? Well, this, now we're going to shift from the issue of uh, writing the, the, the memo or somehow putting out a release uh, later on and the issue of the, the actual direction to McGahn. So the question on the direction to McGahn has a number of different levels to it. Uh, and first, as a matter of, of law, I think the department's position would be that the president uh, can uh, direct the termination or the replacement of a special counsel. And as a matter of law, the obstruction statute does not reach that conduct. Putting that aside, the next question would be, even if it reached the conduct, could you here establish corrupt intent beyond a reasonable doubt. What makes this case very interesting is that when you take away the fact that there were no underlying criminal conduct and you take away the fact that there was no inherently malign obstructive act, that is the president was carrying out his constitutional duties, the question is what is the impact of, of taking away the underlying crime? Um, and um, it's not, as the report suggests, that one impact is, well, we have to find some other reason why the president would obstruct the investigation. But there's another impact, which is, if the president is being falsely accused, which the evidence now suggests that the accusations against him were false, if he, and he knew they were false, and he felt that uh, this investigation was unfair, propelled by his political opponents, and was, and was hampering his ability to govern. That is not a corrupt motive for replacing an independent counsel. So that's another, another reason that you know, we would say that the government would have difficulty proving this beyond a reasonable doubt. 